Happy New Year to you. I'm so glad that you would choose to include Spring Creek in your New Year's resolutions that this is going to be an important part of your life and your weekly experience of coming and joining us as we're challenged by the Word of God, encouraged, given hope, and given a new sense of why we're here in this world. Today is a message that's all about that. I'm calling it alignment. It's about how we get our lives in line with God's ultimate priority. So as we get started, just take a moment, pray with me now. Father, this is your time. These are your people I'm speaking to. I pray that you will use this time that we have together to encourage us, to challenge us, to correct what needs to be corrected. And more than anything, God, when it's all said and done and we say our final amen, that we will know that we met with you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as we get started, I want us to try to put ourselves in the shoes of the people that John wrote the book of Revelation to. Imagine that it's against the law to worship Jesus. Imagine further that the government requires you to give your undivided loyalty to the president, that you have to bow down before an image of him and proclaim him to be God. And if you refuse, the government will take away your driver's license and have you fired from your job. Now, as your pastor, I tell you that you must worship Jesus and him alone. The authorities call me unpatriotic because of that of that stand. They say I'm a rebel, that I'm a troublemaker. They claim I'm preaching treason. So they have me arrested, beaten, then shipped off to Alcatraz. Now, you might begin wondering, you know, what's happening? Why are the people of God being persecuted? Did we do something wrong? Should we pretend to just worship the president so we can provide for our families? I mean, God knows we only love him. What would God have us do? And then a letter comes. It's from me, your pastor. I've had a vision while I've been in prison, but this is no ordinary letter. It's really more like a letter that I've transcribed from somebody else. This is a message from Jesus to his church. It's a message meant to encourage you and warn you and give you hope. Now, if you have a red letter Bible, you would see that chapters two and three of the book of Revelation are written totally in red. Red letter Bibles highlight the words that Jesus spoke. So it's not just the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that contain the words of Christ. The book of Revelation is another message from Jesus about Jesus and to the Jesus people. That means this is his letter to us, his church. And Jesus underscores that very truth when he said, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, if you're spiritually receptive, If you have ears that can hear what Jesus is saying to these seven churches in Asia Minor, he's saying it to all of us too. He's saying it to you and he's saying it to me. Every one of these messages is the message of Christ to his church, his people, to us. So today I want to look at the first church in the book of Revelation, the Ephesian church that Jesus addresses. Let's begin with stuff that you need to know about Ephesus. First, I want to begin with the city. If you look at a map, and here's a map on your screens, you're going to see that Ephesus is located in what is today the country of Turkey. Now, on this map, you'll also see that I've marked where the Isle of Patmos is. Patmos is a Roman penal colony, the deserted island to which John was banished, and from where he writes this letter of Revelation. The order that the churches are addressed in Revelation form a kind of half-moon. Ephesus was first, then you move north to Smyrna, then Pergamon, then on around clockwise until you finally reach Laodicea, which tells you right away that the letter is written in geographical order because this letter was meant to be passed from one city to the next until the circuit was completed. That's why the churches are in the order that they are. So Ephesus itself was called by one Roman writer, Luminasia, which meant the light of Asia. It was the center of worship of Artemis. Now, Artemis is the Greek name for the god. The Roman name for this god was Diana. Artemis is a masculine form of the name. Diana is the feminine form of the name. By the way, this was fairly common in ancient pagan religions that male and female deities switched genders frequently. The temple where Diana was worshipped was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So this first image that's on the screen is what the temple would have looked like in the first century at the height of its glory. The other images are what's left of it today. 
The temple itself was made of Persian marble. According to archaeologists, it was 425 feet long, 260 feet wide. That's more than three acres under roof. It had columns standing 60 feet high, 130 of them all together, and 37 of the columns having gold and jewels literally embedded into the columns itself. The idol of Diana was not exactly what you would call attractive. She had a lot of breasts, which were intended to convey the idea that she was the source of spiritual life and nourishment to the people. Now, you should know the worship of Diana was decadent. There were thousands of priestesses who were nothing more than prostitutes who believed that sexual debauchery could lift the worshiper up into the presence of the gods. Heraclitus, who was a Greek philosopher of the time, he was also a native of the city of Ephesus, once wrote about the worship at this pagan temple. Listen to what he said. The morals of the temple were worse than the morals of animals, for even dogs do not mutilate each other. The people there were fit only to be drowned. So it was an extremely perverted religion. In fact, one of the things this letter to the Ephesians mentions is the cult of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus said he hated. This particular cult flourished in Ephesus. As best we can tell from the early church fathers and references in the scripture itself, this was a group that linked the Christian faith with loose sexual morals. The Nicolaitans believed you could be a Christian, yet still live just like the world when it came to your sexual values. One of the early church fathers, Clement of Alexander, wrote about the Nicolaitans. He said this, they abandoned themselves to pleasure like goats, leading a life of self-indulgence. You see, because the Nicolaitans believed the sinful self could not be conquered or redeemed, they said you might as well go ahead and feed it. So they encouraged their followers to give in to their every sexual desire, which meant this church had a lot of challenges to contend with from the get-go. Not only was the city itself vice central, but there were good numbers of people who claimed Christianity who were just going along with the culture and encouraging others to do the same. So that's the city. Now let's turn our attention to the church. The church in Ephesus was originally founded by none other than the Apostle Paul himself. He had invested three years in Ephesus. Aquila and Priscilla, you probably heard those names, they had been personal mentors to Paul. They also worked for some years in the Ephesian church. Apollos was numbered among the Ephesian pastors, as was Timothy, the young protege of Paul. And guess who else pastored at one time in Ephesus? John, the guy who transcribed the book of Revelation. He was one of their last pastors. In fact, John was likely the pastor at the time when he was arrested by Domitian and exiled 60 miles away to the Isle of Patmos. So this is a church that had sat under some of the most powerful preaching the early church had ever experienced, and they'd undergone amazing transformation. In other words, this is a church with a strong foundation. When people in Ephesus trusted Christ, they'd turn away from their idol worship, they'd walk away from a very depraved lifestyle. There were so many conversions to Christianity in Ephesus that it literally put the idol makers out of business. Now, you could read about that in Acts chapter 19. Demetrius was a silversmith who'd become wealthy by making statues of Diana and selling them for profit. But when Paul preached Christ, people stopped worshiping Diana and they quit buying those idols. The inhabitants of the city were outraged. They took Paul's traveling companions, Gaius and Aris. Aristarchus into the theater of Ephesus to try to get rid of them. Now, I want you to imagine this theater that's on your screens right now, packed with 20,000 people, and for two hours, the people kept shouting, great is Diana of the Ephesians. The gospel was really impacting the culture so much that it was affecting the commerce that was built around the cult of Diana. Now, there's one other thing worth mentioning. Ephesus was also the center of the imperial worship, the worship of the emperor. Domitian was one of the first Roman emperors to demand that his subjects bow down to him and worship him as a god. In the city of Ephesus, he even had a temple built to himself. The base of the temple was made to look like it was standing on the shoulders of the Greek gods, which was Domitian's way of saying he was the god of gods. So he had the statue erected to himself. It stood 20 feet high. It could be seen from anywhere in the city. And he decreed that all the inhabitants of Ephesus must go to this statue, 
bow down and proclaim that Domitian as king of kings and lord of lords of the empire. By the way, this idol of Domitian is all that's left of his idol because it was destroyed after his assassination. No wonder God gave to this church powerhouses like Aquila, Priscilla, Apollos, Paul, Timothy, and John. This was a very hostile environment to the gospel, yet God was powerfully at work in this church changing lives. So into this setting, Jesus speaks. Now let's turn our attention to Jesus' message to the church. First, he begins with commendations, the things that Jesus notices and the things that Jesus loves. Listen to what he says. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Now, I can't emphasize enough that Jesus loves when he sees these things in his church. So if these things are important to him, they should be equally important to us. Let me summarize the three things that Jesus commends. Number one, they worked hard for the kingdom. In other words, these weren't the kind of Christians who thought that church is all about being entertained. They weren't here for the show. They were involved. In fact, the word hard work in this verse literally means sweat producing effort. In other words, these Christians were activists, not couch potatoes. They lived out their faith where the rubber meets the road. They ministered to the needs of the community. They helped the outcast. They were throwing themselves wholeheartedly into the work, and Jesus commends them for that. Second, they stuck with it even in the face of adversity. Jesus said, I know your perseverance. In other words, you persist. You hang in there even when you've been chewed up, beaten down, and cast out. They endured a lot, but they remained faithful. This is not a church that quits when the going got tough. They were determined disciples. Once again, Jesus, Jesus, he loves it when he looks at his church and he finds those who are in it for the long haul. Not those who bail at the first sign of difficulty or problems. There'll always be a lot of people who come and go at church, but Jesus takes special note of those who persevere. The third thing he commends is this. Their faith was well-defined and well defended. Jesus said, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you've tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and you found them false. So this is a group that did their homework. Just because a preacher said it didn't make it true. They checked up on what they were being taught, and they strongly opposed those who were leading the church astray. And these are all, according to Jesus, very good things. These are worth noticing and singling out for praise. Jesus likes it when churches do these things. But there was also correction, the thing that troubles Jesus about this church. Listen to what he said. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now, let me tell you something. Over the years, I sometimes hear complaints about me or the church. And I know I can't make everybody happy, so I'm not going to even try to do what's impossible to do. Of course, some of these things that have been said over the years have been grossly unfair. Sometimes their preferences disguised as biblical absolutes. And some of the things people have said, I've really had to take to heart and learn from them. But when Jesus has something to say about your church, it's not a take it or leave it deal. When Jesus says, I have something against you, it's time to sit up, shut up, and do something about it. Because this is not just somebody's opinion of you. This is the gospel truth coming from Jesus. And really, the indictment of the church in Ephesus comes down to this question, why don't you love me like you used to do? Jesus said, you test things to see whether they're consistent with the Bible. You're a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing, Bible-quoting, Bible-toting church. You, you're serving, you're sacrificing, you're steadfast, you're separated, you're suffering. You're a model congregation, and I know it. But then he says, I've seen your commendable attributes, but I have this one thing against you. You've left your first love. So evidently, you can be a serving church, and still you might have left your first love. And you can be a sacrificing church and have left your first love. And you can be a steadfast church and have left your first love. And you can be a separated church and left your first love. And you can be a suffering church and still have left your first love, which means you can do all the right things and still be in a wrong relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, don't mishear what I'm saying. 
I'm sure there were believers in Ephesus who were saying, I love the Lord. They probably even sang it in church like we do. Jesus' complaint is not that they don't love him. His complaint is they don't love him first. You've left your first love. You may still love me, but you don't love me first. Now, let me explain something about God that we all really need to understand. There are certain things God can't do. People say all the time, God can do anything, and that's not true at all. There are certain things he can't do, like God can't lie. The Bible says that clearly. It's impossible for God to lie. And you know what else? God can't sin. God can't contradict his own nature. Something else, God can't cease to exist because he's eternal. There's just some things God can't do. But for purposes of this message, there's one more thing you need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God can't do. God can't be second. The Bible says this over and over again. Do you remember the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me. God says, I deserve first place in everything. I can't and I won't be second. So what gets first place in your life? If you're a believer and you're anything like the rest of us, I'm pretty confident you'd say, well, easy, that's Jesus Christ. That Jesus deserves first place and no other priority in our life will do. He can't be second to anything else. That's what priorities are all about. Who or what is getting first place in your life? It's about what's most important. It's about what consistently gets moved to the front of the line. What truly captures the most of your time and your energy and your thoughts and your passion and your resources. Now, let me share something with you that I know about people because I know this about me. What I say is most important is not always what really gets first place. Now, I'm not trying to be a hypocrite, nor am I intentionally trying to deceive people. I want what I say to be true, but let me explain. No matter what I tell you is most important, it's not what I say, but how I live that really defines what's most important to me. Does that make sense? Let me illustrate. Let's let's say you have a boyfriend or girlfriend or a husband or wife, and they say all the time, you're the one. They tell you no one is more important in their life than you, but you never go out on dates. They've never bought you anything big or small for a birthday or special special occasion. They've never written you a sweet note. And if you didn't call them, they'd never call you. And when they're at parties, they neglect you and they flirt with everybody else. But they say you're number one. They tell you all the time you're the most important person in their life. So what do you believe? Do you believe their words or their behavior? The truth is this, behaviors don't lie. How I spend my time, where I spend my money, and what ways I choose to invest my energy, that's what's most important to me, regardless of the words I say, because it's not what I say, but how I live that really defines what's most important to me. Do you follow me? Okay, so back to my main point. Right now, there already is something or someone that occupies the number one spot in your life, something you love first. And it's not necessarily what you tell other people that it is. But it's obvious in how you spend your time, where you invest the most energy, and how you spend your money. Whatever's consistently getting the best you have to offer, that's number one to you, and it's number one to me. Like I said, most Christians know the right answer to who gets first place in your life. But honesty demands that I examine my life and ask, regardless of what I say, does my life and do my choices back that up? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor killed under Hitler, reminds us of this truth. He said, our hearts have room only for one all-embracing devotion. So what one thing is your all-embracing devotion? What's your priority? Now, whenever you talk about priorities in the Christian life, invariably, someone will say this. Well, when it comes to my priorities, I put God first, my family second, my church third, and so on and so forth on down the list. And that sounds so spiritual. And for most of my Christian life, I never really questioned it. It just sounded right until you start thinking about how you apply it. Because think about it. Does that hierarchy really help anyone put life in proper perspective? I got to tell you, it doesn't help me much. Because if God's my top priority, my family's second, then why do I spend more time and energy at work than I do on both of them combined? But more fundamentally, if you're going to have a list like that, God shouldn't be at the top of the list. You shouldn't even be on the list. You know why? Because God is not just another item on your to-do list. Okay, went to church today, got my God stuff done for the week. God is the God of all of life. 
We're supposed to seek him first, whether we're playing with our family, negotiating a contract, or balancing our checkbook. We're not to serve God first, our family second, and ourselves last. We're to serve God as we serve our family, as we serve our church, as we go about in our community, as we take care of our own needs. The Christian life is about defining our ultimate priority as loving Christ first in all things. So throughout the Bible, it returns again and again to this theme about how God deserves first place and only first place will do. God demands to be first place in every sphere of life. And when he's no longer first, then something else or someone else occupies his place, which means I've created an idol out of whatever I put in his place. Whatever is first has become my God. Now, God's not saying you don't love me. He's simply saying, you don't love me first, and I'm not your priority, and I don't know how to be second. Did you know that you can make ministry for Christ more important than relationship with Christ? And when that happens, you've left your first love. You let Jesus slide out from the number one position in your life. And you know the bad part about it? We've left him and don't even know we've gone. We can be so busy doing stuff for God that we completely forget who we're doing it for. It's easy in church to become busy with activities and programs and meetings. And as a result, we have little to no time left for a love relationship with Jesus Christ. It happens in marriages, and some of you are living this reality right now. Couples get so busy making a living that they fail to make a life together. Or they get so invested in raising their kids that what's primary, their marriage, takes a back seat and it slowly dies on the vine. I mean, how would you like it if your spouse said, I just don't love you like I used to? I mean, I'll still earn a living. I'll still eat with you, sleep in the same bed, still be a parent to our kids. I just won't love you like I once did. Would would that be acceptable to you? In a sense, that's what the Ephesians are doing to Jesus. Lord, I just don't love you like I once did. But I want you to know I'll still come. I'll still work. I'll still serve. I'll still give. I'll still believe the truth. And guess what? Jesus is not okay with that. Here's the deal. You couldn't get the Ephesian church to compromise doctrinally. There's no way this group of believers is ever going to succumb to false teaching. And they're certainly not lazy. They're not doing a halfway job. But merely saying or doing right things is not enough. At some point, it doesn't matter whether or not what you're saying is true. If it's being said or done without love, then it no longer represents an accurate description of who God is. Which leads me to this. When rightness leads to wrongness. You know, let me tell you something. Our enemy, Satan, he's so clever. He loves to take virtues and corrupt them. He loves it because we never think to look for Satan in the good stuff. We don't think of him as twisting good things into bad things. In Ephesus, Satan took the doctrinal purity of the church, a hardworking church, which is a beautiful thing, and he used it to corrupt them. He used it to make them feel like they were better than all the compromisers. Listen to how Brian Blount described it in his commentary in the book of Revelation. Apparently, the Ephesians became too discerning. In the same way that a healthy cell can metastasize into a cancerous one, their commendable insight degenerated into discrimination. They segregated those who were deemed workers of appropriate righteousness from those determined to be unrighteous. Once a loving community, they had become a policing community. Now, we've seen this throughout church history. Triumphalism is the self-righteous idea that your doctrines, your beliefs, your culture is right and everyone else is wrong. And when we think this way, we demonize everyone who disagrees with us or believes differently from us. When we find ourselves focusing on how wrong everybody else is and how right we are, we need to stop and ask ourselves, what am I making the higher priority? Am I following Jesus by loving my neighbor as myself, or has my opinion become more important than my neighbor? This is a hard thing, because we all love our opinions, don't we? We get pretty excited about them and passionate about convincing others that we're right and they're wrong, or at least misinformed or ignorant. You see, the letter to Ephesus is about what happens when our zeal to be right overtakes the love that we're called to live. There's something in the human heart that takes righteousness and twists it into self-righteousness. 
And when we feel self-righteous, we stop listening because we assume the other person's wrong and only one of us can be right. So I end up using my rightness to prove your wrongness. You know, I've studied the Gospels for years, and I can't find a single example in the life of Jesus where he ever employed this style of debate with anybody. The one who was more right than anyone who's ever lived never wielded righteousness like a weapon. This is what I mean by Satan using our virtues against us. The greatest strength of the church can become its greatest weakness. Ephesus is known as a church that was getting it right, standing up to evil, standing up against false doctrine. But it's like I heard someone say, it's hard for a watchdog to smile. Every virtue carries within it the seeds of its own destruction. Love grows cold in the lives of believers who are passionate about the truth, but neglecting their love relationship with Christ. You know, the danger is in becoming judge. The danger about becoming judgmental is this. We become too good at it. It becomes our preoccupation. We become experts at minutia. Friends, there's no glory for God in people who go around spouting off true statements about him and all the while estranging the very ones that God loves. Now, the good news in this passage is even though Jesus has exposed these problems in the church, he also gave them the remedy, not just what's wrong, but here's how to fix it. And that's what my last point is all about, the path back to God. So this is our realignment. The first step in the journey back is this, remember. Jesus says, so remember where you were before you fell. Remembering is an essential ingredient in life change. The, Ephes the Ephesian church, they, they needed to remember what had changed for them. What was the main difference between where they are now, years after their conversion, and where they were when they first heard the gospel? What is it that they needed to remember? I believe the biggest difference between where they are now versus when they first came to Christ was their awareness of their own sinfulness. And I'll tell you why I think this way, because Jesus once told a story about who loves the most. It's found in Luke chapter 7. Jesus tells us that those who are forgiven much, love much. Do you remember this story? Jesus is in the home of uh, Simon. He's a Pharisee. And a prostitute comes into the home to wash Jesus' feet. People in the room are disgusted by her mere presence. Once she enters, everyone kind of gathers in closer to see what Jesus would say or do. So this woman walks right up to Jesus, kneels at his feet, wets them, with her tears, and then uses her long hair as a towel to dry them off completely. She then empties a flask of ointment onto his feet. His host, Simon, says to himself, if Jesus were really a prophet, then he would know what type of woman this is who's touching him, that she is a sinner, that he would have nothing to do with her. It's at this point Jesus tells Simon a story about two guys who owed a man money. One owed him a lot, the other owed just a little. The man forgave both of them their debts. And then Jesus asked Simon, which man would love the one who forgave his debt more? And Simon answered correctly, the one who had the bigger debt. And Jesus said, you're right. Those who are forgiven much, love much. And of course, Jesus' point is this breathtaking display of love that they've just witnessed as this prostitute has washed and anointed the feet of Jesus. This woman loves much because she's been forgiven much. And Simon, who was his host, didn't do any of these things for Jesus, because when it really came down to it, Simon just didn't know what it was like to be forgiven. And as a result, he didn't know what it meant to really love. I mean, this is the problem in Ephesus. And for all of us today, we're all sinners, and we need to remember that. But not just that we're sinners, but that this God who's rich in mercy forgave us and made us new. Jesus calls on us to remember that we're sinners saved by grace. At one point, the Ephesians knew that. At one point, they'd been like the woman at Jesus' feet, but now they'd become like Simon. Like Simon, they're now consumed with the distinction between us and them. Like Simon, when they thought of sinners, they thought of others, not themselves. And like Simon, because they've lost touch with what it means to be forgiven of such a great debt, they failed to love Jesus with all their heart. Bottom line is this, we love to the extent that we understand how much we need him. We love to the extent that we believe that he's forgiven us. Jesus is saying, go back to the days of desperation. Remember when you were first saved and you were blown away by God's grace. 
you love God so much, then something happened. You started hanging around with Christians, and you learned how to act the right way and say the right things, and you began to realize that you were no longer the worst people you knew. All of a sudden, you found yourself looking at others and wondering what their problem is, because now we're the ones who have it all together, and we don't mind letting you know that. And when that happens, something inside dies. This deep, surrendered love that comes from a place of being loved in our brokenness. So Jesus tells them first to remember. And then Jesus tells them, repent. I mean, that's the word in Revelation 2.5, repent. The truth of the matter is this. The church fell out of love with Jesus and fell in love with religious activity. The only way back into a love relationship is to go back to the place where you fell away. You know, I stay busy in kingdom work, but nothing, and I do mean nothing, can become more important for me than to personally connect with God. In fact, the busier I am, the more time I need with God. If you're working hard like the Ephesian church, then you're not going to, if you're not at the same time sending down your roots deeper into Christ, then you are going to die on the vine. You'll be giving out of a deficit. You'll be giving people only what you've got, and quite frankly, people need more than what you and I have to give. Listen to how Eugene Peterson said it. Let me simplify your lives. When others are telling you that you need to read one more book, I want you to read less. When others are telling you to do more and more and you'll find God, I want to tell you to do less. When others are telling you to have more and you'll find God, I want to tell you to have less. The world does not need more of you. It needs more of God. Your friends do not need more of you. They need more of God. And you don't need more of you. You need more of God. To repent is to have a change of mind and direction. That's what repentance is all about, to renounce your pride, admit you're wrong, stop heading down the dead-end path, because the sooner you turn around, the sooner you get out of the mess that you're in. Love Jesus first, and the focus of all of your endeavors on Him is what counts. The final thing says that Jesus has to say to the church is this, return. He says, and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, when Jesus says, do the things you did at first, some people think that means to remember all that excitement you had when you first became a Christian. Like Jesus is saying, you you lost that. You need to get back to that. I've actually heard this preached many times. But is Christ really saying that you need to somehow recapture the enthusiasm of your first years as a Christian? I don't think so. You know why? Because I see this in unhealthy marriages all the time. When things aren't going well, they try to reignite the superficial stuff like date nights and flowers and candy. In other words, they try to recapture the infatuation of the early days of courtship. But the best and deepest love in marriage isn't found in the past. I can tell you from the heart, I've never yearned for the shallowness of our early years in marriage because we've built something better. What we have today is deep and satisfying. It's not fickle. It's not easily offended. It's not insecure. It's not clingy. In a healthy marriage, love deepens over time. It matures. The earliest love is never the best love. Same thing in our walk with Christ. The connection I had to Christ at first was so tenuous. I had no security in my walk with him. I I felt like I could lose it as easily as I found it. So I don't think Christ is calling the church to somehow recapture the enthusiasm of their early years. Besides, Christ doesn't say you have lost your earlier love. He says you've forsaken your er your first love. So he's talking about something very specific here. The one thing about the early days that Jesus wants us to recapture is when I first started out, I put him first. The things you did at first was to put him first. When Christ is no longer front and center of who you are and what you're about, then your life has become about something else. I suspect what happened is what happens in many marriages. Life gets busy, and the person you love gets taken for granted. They're no longer the priority they once were. But there's one more thing Jesus has to say. He says, if they don't remedy this problem, he'll take away their lampstand. Now, do you understand what's at stake in losing your lampstand? The significance of the lampstand is in the tabernacle and the temple. The lampstand illuminated the way to the Holy of Holies. In other words, it lit the way to the presence of God. And that's the purpose of the church, to light the way to God. Because, you see, we live in a dark and broken world. 
Only the light of the gospel can show people the way out. But the truth of the gospel is compromise when it's shared without love. When the church fails at love, it fails at everything. And Jesus is telling us, lose your love and you lose your witness to the world. Christ will not tolerate for long his people saying right things, but doing so in unloving ways. To lose our ability to communicate the truth in love is a big problem. So serious that Jesus says, if you don't correct it, I'll remove your lampstand. In other words, the church will cease to be the church. Their light will go out without love. That means no more influence, no more spiritual impact. They would spend their days doing religious but irrelevant things. And sadly, there's just thousands of churches like this today. They're, they're still meeting Sunday after Sunday. They're doing religious stuff, holding Sunday school, singing hymns, re reciting the Apostles' Creed, but having no spiritual impact, seeing no change in people's lives, having no co effect on their community whatsoever. Their light has gone out. Now, if the Holy Spirit is stirring in your heart right now, and you're feeling conviction from him that this letter to the Ephesians is about what's going on in your own life right now, I don't want you to beat yourself up for it. I want you to thank God for that. The fact that you're sensing God at work in your heart is evidence that your heart is not hard. The desire in your heart to love Christ more is the work of the Holy Spirit. Bernard of Clairvaux said it like this, the heart is hard only when it does not know it is hard. A man is hardened only when he does not know he is hardened. When we are concerned about our coldness, it is because of the yearning God has put there. So if you find yourself yearning to truly have Christ first in all things, to bring your life back into alignment, to love him first, to seek him first, to want nothing less and nothing else but his will in every aspect of your life, then thank him that you feel that way. It shows you that God is working in your heart right now to draw you back to that place of pure devotion to him. Always remember, it's love for Christ that motivates everything we do. I'll never forget, I, I read this story from a South American pastor named Juan Carlos Ortiz. It was in his book called Disciple. He said this, a student in our congregation always seemed to be so busy. Every time we approached him about something, he'd say, oh, excuse me, but I have no time. I'm studying, I'm working eight hours a day, so you can imagine how I can't do anything more than that. I can make worship once a week, but the rest of the time, I'm occupied. But then Ortiz said this, then one day he fell in love. Suddenly, he found time to visit his girlfriend three or four times a week. How did he do it? I don't know. Love did it. I mean, that's really it, isn't it? Love is what shapes our time, our priorities, our life. What we really love will determine how we spend our hours, spend our life, determine what's most important. So my question for you is simply this. How is your love for Christ leading you to spend your time? Or maybe more specifically, what do your priorities say about who or what you really love? Jesus tells us the problem is not that you don't love me. It's that you don't love me first.